with those words, I think it's uh, time to hand over to Patrick, who will take us uh, through uh, the network rail case. You have uh, half an hour. Okay. <laughs> and I'll stop watch running. Super, super quick wrapping up uh, after that. So, please. Yeah. Um, so I'm Patrick Bossert. I lead Ernst & Young's uh, UK and Ireland infrastructure intelligence practice. Um, can I say, though, what a difficult presentation to follow. I, it's super exciting to see a CEO of a company talk so passionately about asset management. That's a rare thing, and it's fantastic. Cost curves, technology, very exciting. Um, I hope to combine actually some, some of Mikhail's presentation with some of Philip's and talk about uh, technology and its value to uh, generating more economic value from infrastructure, but also technology as an enabler for change in big infrastructure organizations. Uh, I joined Ernst & Young a year ago. Um, before then, I was Digital Transformation Director at Network Rail. So an organization very much like Barna Denmark, uh, 30,000 kilometers of track, uh, power networks, telecoms, you name it, there's a lot of assets there. Asset value uh, around about, I think, 480 billion krona, and I ran an asset management transformation program that was uh, 2.8 billion krona. Um, and I'll share some of that with you uh, and the logic for it. Um, since, so three things I want to cover really is first of all the economic value of infrastructure, so the big picture stuff, then the, the use of data to drive more value, and then uh, transformation, and that's where I'll focus on the network rail story. And since joining Ernst & Young, I've been working largely with the UK government looking at the value of infrastructure to the economy. Um, we have slow economic growth in the UK. It's steady, but it's slow. Our GDP grows um, by around 2.5% a year. Um, looking at Denmark's better GDP, I think the question that we've been asked to answer government in the UK of can better use of infrastructure improve economic productivity, um, looking at the, the recent GDP figures and some of the challenges here, I think you could be asking yourselves the same question. Can we do more with infrastructure? So the model we developed, which you saw very briefly earlier, for looking at this challenge is really looking at the whole economic life cycle of infrastructure from how you build it, operate it, uh, provide services through to the services that are used by citizens. Um, and this breaks very much down into the capital expenditure phase and then the operational expenditure, so the facilities management part. And that's where the cost curves in Mikhail's presentation came from. But what we were really interested in is actually infrastructure is here to provide services. It's to connect people with jobs, to connect um, manufacturers with markets. So what's the economic value of the services that infrastructure provides? And can you optimize the infrastructure to deliver more supply um, or even shape demand? And then not just what's the pounds or, or krona economic value, but what is the socioeconomic value? How do we actually make our towns and cities work better for the people that live in them? Um, and that it's through to uh, quality of life and quality of air and noise pollution and all those other things. So this is the, the canvas that we used for economic valuation. And I've got some figures here from the UK, which is how much we spend every year in this part. We spend 90 billion, so multiply that uh, by, I think, eight and a half to get the krona value, but 90 billion pounds on construction every year. We spend 120 billion facilities managing and operating the assets that have already been built. Now, if you get this right, you can end up making this quite a bit smaller for new designs. Again, back to the cost curves. Do you invest a bit more up front? But what people often don't think about is the economic output that gets attached to every pound spent. Basically, for every pound spent, you get six 
pounds 20 or so of economic return every year. Um, and if you invest right in designing the right assets, you can make this cost smaller and this economic outturn much larger. So a lot of what we're doing now are business cases that look at the whole economic uh, value of the asset, not just the whole life cost, the totex cost of the asset. And you start looking at things in a very, very different way. And these numbers are quite a big part of our 1.9 trillion economy. So the question was really, how do we drive more from infrastructure? Um, and this is where, I mean, there's a lot of things changing in the market. There's sort of market disruptors, which I've listed along the top. But this is where technology disruptors and enablers really do come in. So, I mean, Mikhail talked about drones and LIDAR, um, artificial intelligence, um, visual augmented reality, modular design with BIM. All of these things are real tools that we can use now. But the challenge is linking these to economic output. There's a very big gap between the technology and the result. So we looked at each area, and some of this was work we did at Network Rail, or I did at Network Rail previously. But in the capital expenditure space, I mean, this has already been talked about. BIM, building information modeling. We've just produced the business case for UK government to invest more in the development of BIM. Um, so that it is mandatory for all government expenditure. Um, so designs now of prisons, hospitals, schools are becoming, for a start, um, 3D and 4D in design and time. Um, but they're also moving to more and more high-value off-site manufacturing so that schools and, and government facilities can actually be built in factories and assembled on site. Um, We've been doing some work with Rolls-Royce at the extreme end of high-value off-site manufacturing, which is small portable nuclear reactors. So do we need to build big new power stations when the whole shape of our grid is changing, or can we actually deploy portable power at locations where it's needed? Um, so lots of opportunity there. And then we're also working with GE around the sort of ultimate BIM, which is you don't only design the thing and work out how you're going to construct it in sequence, you actually operate it virtually. So with Britain's new nuclear build program, which is the most expensive construction program, I think, in Europe currently, um, we've been modeling the nuclear facility to a point where you can train people on its operation before anything has been built on site. So you're actually running the full operating environment as well. So there's a lot of potential from the technology there. In the facilities management space, um, this is where the work we did with uh, Network Rail, um, really, uh, I learned an awful lot from it. We proved an awful lot from it. Um, the way you release value in facilities management is moving from time-based management of assets, which is a pretty low asset management policy maturity, through managing assets on their condition, which is very much where drones and, and visual inspection and LIDAR come in, through to building intelligence models around what causes assets to degrade, feeding in data about how assets are used and how they perform. So you now move to a very predictive model where you almost don't need to inspect the asset anymore. You can just predict when the concrete is going to fail, the steel cabling is going to degrade and so on through to fully risk-based asset management, where you're actually playing with risk, cost, and performance parameters almost to the extreme of what you can deliver. Um, the program, I'll come back to the program we, we uh, ran and its value, but you can see you need progressively more information to be able to move to the next stage, but each stage releases a huge, huge amount of value. Um, and then in the world of providing services, we find that often the infrastructure that you have was built for a purpose. It was designed for a purpose. But there's great opportunity to optimize supply. Um, so we've seen programs like smart metering, which actually helps national grid optimize the balancing of supply and be much more predictive in how it operates. We've seen 
um, on the railway, and I have to say Denmark is leading the world in this at the moment, ERTMS and the deployment of digital train control to run trains closer together so you can get more capacity on your network. Um, I had the, the privilege to lead the ERTMS business case for the UK and UK railway. Um, some parts of the railway, we can put 40% more trains on the existing infrastructure, which is quite phenomenal. Um, so we have a lot we can borrow, actually, from Denmark here. Um, and also smart motorways, getting a lot more traffic on the roads just by controlling the speed and the flow of traffic. It's amazing how much more throughput you can, you can get by dynamically changing the speeds. Um, and at the moment, line-side signage is really a very crude way of achieving that. But there's so much more we can do with that. So from that, you can actually get more from the infrastructure you already have without necessarily building more. And then, well, I should touch on shaping demand. If you then introduce and layer on road user pricing, once you've maxed out supply, you can then start to shape demand. But you need more real-time intelligence, more communications, a very, very dynamic and responsive closed loop control. And ultimately, you're into how the service is used and learning more through IoT and sensors about how people are actually using the infrastructure in which they exist. And the other part of our work for government was then looking at how asset systems can be modeled, multiple asset systems, whether it's roads or energy or utilities, to support communities, to support cities, and ultimately linking to the National Infrastructure Investment Plan. Uh, too often, road and rail investments are made completely separately without thinking about the actual flow of people from where they live to where they need to work. So this is about extending BIM, building information modeling, to become effectively infrastructure information modeling. And uh, there's some exciting work being done on that. Um, so that gives you an idea of where technology can release value from infrastructure. I'd like now to focus on the OPEX part and specifically the work we did at Network Rail. So this was real infrastructure, 35,000 people working on the infrastructure, 170-year-old ways of working that almost hadn't changed. Everyone worked on paper. Knowledge about assets was in people's heads. Um, so it was a, a 2.8 billion kroner change program with 42 separate projects within it. Uh, and the, the intention was to realize uh, roughly 850 million a year, uh, kroner a year of direct cash benefit to the business, plus all sorts of other benefits. Um, I'd point out though that most people think, if you are dealing with technology enablers, that most of the spend will be on technology. But in fact, 29% of the spend was on technology and systems and integration. The rest was actually on business uh, process change and business change, uh, and some on data improvement as well. There was a bit around program governance and delivery as well on a program of this scale. It's not surprising. But just bear that in mind, in a unionized industry where change is difficult to deliver, you do have to spend a, a, a huge amount on the change effort, not just on the technology. Um, and talking about change effort, actually a really big part is getting people from all bits of the business. So from capital planning, from operations, from utility provision, um, from asset management. Um, and getting them to think about the balance between risk, that is a corporate set of risks. You don't just own your own risks. It's all about how it rolls up to risk. Um, risk, cost, so in this game we've given people paper money. Um, and then the performance and the output. And it's amazing. The first time you run this game with an executive team, they're all looking up after their own part. By the time you've run it three times, they're all saying, well, hang on. Um, you need to build this facility for me to put my output in it, so let me give you some of the capital. And people are starting to talk about risk, cost, and performance in a joined-up way across the silos. But doing it with a board game is one thing. Doing it with a real business is a whole other challenge. And how do you link all that fan fantastic technology to the business goals? 
Well, we found you have to go through a process of understanding what the goals are, looking at how value can be released. So is it an improvement in asset policy maturity? Um, what, what processes need to change? Because you don't unlock value with the technology, you unlock value from changing how a company does something. If you're changing something and spending less money, you're pushing up the risk. So what tools do you need to pull the risk back down and manage risk and support the decisions? What information do you need to feed into those tools? And then further, what types of information and where will you store them and connect them through to actually what are the data stores and is it in the cloud or does it need to be secure? Information security runs all the way through this. Through to how do you get the information in? Is it drones and airborne systems or is it people with handheld devices? Or do we put more kit on the trains? We had trains with huge numbers of sensors, ultrasonics, ground penetrating radar, you name it. Um, and what we found, and I, I've spoken to many, many people that were in my role in other companies, in energy companies, utility companies. What we found is if you take a business-led approach, then unlocking the value makes sense. It's sort of achievable because you know what you're trying to do. If you take an IT systems-led approach, there is a risk when you put in a big ERP system that you codify the processes that exist in the business today. It then makes it very hard to change the processes to unlock the value. I'm not saying putting in an IT system is wrong. It may be part of what you're trying to do. But going left to right is a very, very powerful way of unlocking value. We've seen other programs that start just by collecting huge amounts of data. And engineers get very excited because they can build failure models from all that data. But connecting those models back into releasing business value is then very difficult. Um, so there's a balance. Um, we went very much left to right and then supplemented it with some right to left sort of really smart sensor technology and a bit of AI as well. Um, but finding that right balance is really important. I would say the programs that have run into the most difficulty that we've seen have started with let's replace the 270 asset management systems we've got with a big ERP implementation. You tend to just get stuck doing that, and it takes a very long time. And a very long time is not what you want in an infrastructure business if you're trying to bring about change. So at Network Rail, I won't go through how we built the change roadmap. That's, that would take a whole other session. But we ended up with a five-year change roadmap. And the thing you'll notice about this roadmap is there's a lot of stuff on it. And every 30 days, 60 days, something new and exciting happened within the business. Um, so it goes on. Um, so it was over five years. And, and you'll see, actually, at the beginning of this, there's a lot of outputs to people. I'll zoom in on this. but. To people with yellow hard hats, we focused very much on doing things with the frontline workforce first, because that's where change really happens. Um, I think involving that workforce and actually driving change from what they want to see, while in the background you're doing some of the really difficult stuff with the ERP, the data models, the master data management, which can lead to some very exciting stuff later on. It's striking that balance between outside-in workforce-driven change and strategic business-enabling change. So we built this roadmap. Um, it focused on outputs, on beneficiaries. So who benefits? Is it strategic planning? Is it the maintenance workforce? Um, is it the capital works people? Is it the, the EU and regulatory compliance? Uh, or is it the regulator and the funder? And we looked at then, what are the actual outputs? What really changes in the business? So this, this wasn't the project plan. We had the project plan in huge detail. Um, but this was for us to communicate what really changes. 
and not only who benefits, but then explain what type of benefits. So is it safety, performance, cost, reputation? Um, and this whole journey started with, in month one, so when, when we got the funding for the program, we said within four weeks, we're going to have the first thousand mobile devices out with frontline workers. And these were the most junior workers. So a lot of managers were really, really quite cross that we didn't start with them. But the whole point was, it was about giving the workforce the tools for the job and the right tools. So we issued phones and iPads, we issued them unlocked so people could put their own games and applications on them, have their own personal email. The only thing they had to do was come to work with them charged up. Um, people, of course, took them home, showed them to their families, showed them to their mates in the pub. Um, you know, you'd never believe I got this from work. They, hadn't, they really didn't expect to get a quality device like this. Had I left it to procurement, we'd have ended up with some cheap Android OEM device. Um, we had to force it through as well, that we were going to buy the best technology that was appropriate for the job. Um, Initially, we didn't write any apps. We just gave everyone an email address. And we got another 6,000 phones out in the next, uh, next two months. And very quickly, we were up to 12,000 phones. The frontline workforce didn't before have their own email addresses. So we gave them a corporate identity. That was really important. It said, we trust you with this device. And we're giving you an identity. It's not just through your manager. And of course, people start emailing pictures of assets and defects to each other. And before you know it, there's just this whole buzz. People are changing the way they work. We didn't write a single app. We didn't change a single corporate database. It just caught on. Um, we did then introduce a GPS app uh, connected to the measurement trains so that people could locate faults accurately. That was exciting because one in three um, uh, track geometry corrections, which usually involves eight people going out with trolleys and ballast and digging the track and, and just leveling it. One in three jobs were being done in the wrong place. You think, oh, that's terrible. But if you have to walk for kilometers and kilometers pulling a trolley with bags and all that stuff, and you get to a work site and you have to push a spirit level along for half an hour to try and find a slight wobble in the track, there's a good chance that you'll find a wobble but it's not the one that really is the big wobble that only, you can only see if there's a train on it. So a lot of work was being done in the wrong place. We introduced GPS, and almost overnight, every job was being done, this manual lifting and packing jobs. All the jobs started being done in the right place. The satisfaction for the workers around that was huge. It was about doing meaningful work. We then... Uh, I think made the biggest mistake we could have possibly made. And that is, we launched an app ideas competition to the workforce. And you know, we thought we might get 10 ideas for apps on the mobiles. We got over 300. And we just weren't ready for it. We had a budget of a few million pounds. Um, we had a, an agency with about five teenagers that were ready to write the apps. We were woefully underprepared, so we really had to gear up and catch up. Um, so the only thing is, if you tap into the enthusiasm of a workforce, you've really got to be ready to follow through on that promise. But we ended up with apps to get rid of manuals and books. We ended up, the most popular app was a how-to app. This is like a mini YouTube where maintenance staff could film how they do something. And it was surprising how, how often when people are waiting to go on a job, they'll just check with the app just to make sure they know how to use that bit of equipment. On the railway, there's so many bits of equipment and you get trained on new stuff all the time. So the real turning point was when we introduced digital works order management and condition data capture on the tablets and phones. What we did was we gave people control over their own work banks. And this was revolutionary. So it wasn't a manager in the office deciding what work needed to be done in what order. Now people on the track could walk out and go, you know what, that's OK for another four weeks. Let's swap that around. Um, here's a Me, the talking three words is Santa. 
And this started happening all over the railway. Suddenly people were controlling and managing their own work. We then introduced some predictive analytics um, so that people could now see how well the work was performing, but the systems would also point to where work would need to be done in future. My name's Tim Patterson. I'm the flat section manager based out of Salisbury in Birmingham. And I've been on the railway for 27 years. Labs have transformed the way that we work. It helps me plan better. It helps me make better decisions because all the information is in one place. In the past, I would have to go searching for information. But with labs, I can get all that information on one screen. It can give me the condition of that, like an x-ray, ground penetration radar. It can give me track geometry readings. It can give me what work is done. It works, and that in turn will then keep my guys safer while producing it on the land to allow them to track. So you're not repeating the wrong job, but you can do the right job. It saves you time, it saves you money, and it saves you doing unnecessary work, and I think it's really interesting. And that took, not only did it mean that we were doing less work and it was in the right place and there was less cost, but it also took about 70,000 man hours a year away from trackside and it became much safer. Um, and at this point, the tool, we were doing full predictive maintenance and renewal of track. Three years on, the number of broken rails per year went from 320 in 2016 to zero in 2016. So not only did we take a huge amount of cash cost out of the business, we also increased the safety and performance quite considerably. It then moved to very safety critical assets, so S and C, and the accents are a bit hard to understand. I know they're from all sorts of regions within the UK. Um, but the, the switches and crossings are you know, super safety critical. People are very nervous about moving to predictive or risk-based analysis. I'm Steve Francis on the Great Aston for East Midlands. Historically, the SCC is our beach switch. The consequences of getting it wrong are severe. Land is a, is a good example of that. It's a beach switch because it's complex, uh, it's sort of the moving parts, it's multidisciplinary, and it's expensive to, to renew and refurbish. Having better information for our decision making is, is absolutely key. And my business plan is, is the best part of £300 million, pounds and, and for the for the everyday customer, that, that, that's a hell of a lot of money and, and we've got to be able to demonstrate that we're spending that money wisely and, and the only way of doing that is information and data and being able to back up, back up our decisions with facts and, and, and the decision making, the SEC decision making software does that for us so we can fix it. And the effect was that we actually moved from renewing lots of points to heavy refurbishment work, which ironically actually resulted in a more reliable asset. Um, you often get quite a lot of faults with renewals. Um, only a couple more short, very short videos. Um, we then introduced LIDAR. We lidar the whole railway with um, colour spectroscopy so we could even tell every type of tree and plant that was along the, the railway to be, develop predictive vegetation models. My name is Ian Sam. I work in York and I'm a senior design manager for the geotechnical design team. Well, the benefits of the wind mill for us, predominantly focused on reliable information, is that we no longer have to send people to a site to undertake a topographic survey on, on very steep, unstable slopes that are over tested. We can basically see the entire slope and have to strip there from our desktop without the wind mill design. We feel the wind mill is really the revolution of what we've been doing. We've been now a vast amount of information that can be our days and weeks, if not months, procuring the survey. It's a, it's a much safer way of working. We have 10,000 kilometres of really steep embankments in the railway. Um, and for the first time, because of this tool, we were able to do a complete risk analysis of all of the slope risk of all of those embankments, rather than doing sort of random point inspections. And really, I mean, there's, there's so much to this journey, but the message I want you to get is um, we involve people throughout, uh, a bit like uh, was it Lily at the bridge with her telephone? Um, we didn't ignore those people. We actually got them into the room, got them to design the apps with us, built that trust in the data and the decisions that were being made. And one video just to finish. Um, this was filmed right at the beginning of the process. And it's just a member of the workforce talking about that process and how important it is to him.
as a section manager, the safe that keeps my track is the seal and envelope. It's it's what we do. And I don't think any other section manager would be any other that. This is also good because it's not just about being safe and reliable anymore, it is providing services from top to the top, making them their train for the retail they can run. The decision support tool will make a massive change from how I do my job. Really, I can't emphasize how much it's changed it makes. In a minute, it is a one stop gateway for all of my tracks of every part of data that's collected for the track. Update traces, track quality diagrams, training diagrams, the whole area of the setup will be on there live on the iPad. So it will save a lot of, a lot of paper, especially in this sort of weather when it's raining and trying to stick to it on the, the weather app. We have new systems come in that really better time because we can use it, is vital nowadays. I've been involved with the building and the makeup of the system since the outset. I think if anybody gets a phone call from their line manager asking you know, to be involved with any part of it, I think people should jump in it. I think everybody can make that little bit of difference. Now I've seen what we've made, and I know it's going to work, and I know it will change other section managers' ways to do their job. Yeah, I have heard it, and I have been involved with it and lived and breathed it for a long time. So to get it right is going to will make a very bad thing the day. another section manager will say, that's a great bit of then what more do you need? And that was the most exciting part of the job, working with people um, that were really committed to bringing about change. So I hope that's given you a little bit of additional insight into the two presentations that you've already seen around how to connect the world of technology with the world of business. Um, and just back to the numbers and the economy to finish, um, we've seen with BIM, you can get up to 25% more output and productivity for your design for the same money. You can get four schools, or five schools, for the price of four. Um, with asset management, it's not difficult to take 20, 10 to 20% of the cost out of your operation. With full risk-based, you could probably go further, but very few infrastructure businesses will go there. And with the services, delivering 5 to 15% more output from existing infrastructure is quite realistic. Uh, whether it's roads or railways or even energy distribution networks. Our work has shown that the UK could benefit from a 0.75% year uh, PA improvement to the GDP output by taking some of these measures. That's the more conservative end of it. Actually, you know, there's an even bigger prize. So I encourage you all to look to where those prizes are here in Denmark. Um, and a lot of these things, we're not just advising, we're actually developing platforms and services and solutions with our customers through a whole range of innovation centers around the world. Again, it's quite exciting to be a business that wants to be part of that rather than just standing on the outside. So economic value of infrastructure, data to drive greater value, and a results-based transformation program that really engages the people in its delivery. Thank you very much.